So Dan, uh, Dan Rubin, a PhD student uh, at the Columbia, uh, will continue on nano something, uh, V1. Okay. Um, everyone, oh, that's actually way too loud, isn't it? Is that all right? Does that work? Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks to the organizers and the Gatsby Foundation and Duquesne for the introduction. I'm going to talk about one direction that we've taken this work, which is taking the inhibition stabilized network regime, which Ken described at the end of his talk, and seeing how it behaves when we integrate it into a nonlinear network and looking at some of the interesting nonlinearities in the V1 response that, that explains. I'll check my time now. Okay. Um, so briefly, an outline. Uh, so Ken talked about the classical receptive field and extra classical receptive field that's the center and surround. So I'm going to be talking about uh, first just looking with a linear model um, how the inhibition stabilized network or ISN regime uh, can explain uh, some interesting spatially periodic effects that people observe. And then from there, move on to two major chunks of work uh, working with nonlinear models and some of the cool things that we can do. Um, so. When Ken was talking about center and surround, he was really talking about there's a center and there's a surround. But we know in reality that the picture is more complex, that, that the extra classical receptive field can have a very complicated spatial structure. And one experiment that illustrates this very nicely um, is length tuning experiments, where you take an individual cell in V1 and you show it stimuli of progressively increasing length. And if you do that and you measure intracellularly and your Anderson et al. in 2001, what you find is that the inhibitory conductance received by cells seems to have a, 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 a spatial modulation. That is, the length tuning curve has two peaks. One, for reasonably small stimuli at the, at the first peak that people have observed many, many times before, and a second, and this was the surprising result here, for very long stimuli. Um, is it all right if I open this? And so the question that I first addressed when I joined up in the lab is, can we use this ISN model to gain any, to gain any insight as to where this kind of effect comes from? Um, oh, and I also want to point out that not only do you see this when you average over lots and lots of cells um, in V1 looking at conductance, but it's also been observed in firing rate curves as well, although less talked about. Uh, just say this is a real effect. Um, so, to look at this uh, in terms of a model with spatial structure, we had to expand the ISN model to examine the dimension of spatial structure. So we do that in the following way. We take these EI pairs that Ken described, and now we arrange them along a dimension of retinotopic or cortical space. So we give this model spatial extent. Then we connect the model roughly the way layer 2, 3 is connected. Uh, giving the excitatory cells these long-range connections. Uh, Xiaoping also talked about this. Uh, and then inhibitory cells, more local connections. So in this model, our excitatory cells connect to all the other excitatory cells uh, with a connectivity function that decreases as a, as a function of distance, which is just a Gaussian here. Uh, so the E cells connect to the other E cells as well as to the I cells, whereas the I cells are more local, and they connect only to themselves and their local E neighbor. Now, when we're modeling stimuli here, um, we're really concerned right now with just the spatial profile of the stimulus. So this is pretty bad contrast. This is supposed to be uh, just, just a grading stimulus of constant contrast. So for the sake of this model, we call that just a smooth step function here. So this is the contrast profile of this stimulus. Um, and then, of course, importantly, this network is within the ISN, or inhibition stabilized network regime. Um, and that's important because that's, those are the effects we're looking at. Um, and so if we model this network here, it's just a strictly linear network. So we've got some recurrent weights here, and we've got the input of a certain contrast, and it's got a shape H. Um, the connectivity matrix was also already well described. And so just to be explicit here, a network is in this regime when two mathematical requirements are met. First, as Ken said, the recurrent excitation is unstable. So here this WEE submatrix has got at least one eigenvalue greater than one, but the overall network is stable. So all of the eigenvalues of this larger matrix are all less than one, a real part less than one. Um, and so, does it work? It does. Uh, and it does so in an interesting way. We were surprised to see this. Um, this network is able 
to generate these multiple peaked length tuning curves uh, through an interesting mechanism. What happens is as this network sees larger and larger stimuli, it transforms that smooth step function input into a spatially periodic standing wave of activity in the output. So you can see that here. I plot network position on these little x axes. And as you increase the stimulus length, you begin to see these standing waves of activity. And importantly, the edge of the stimulus representation is always matched to a peak in one of these standing waves. And so you can imagine if you were recording intracellularly from this cell with your electrode at the cell located at position zero, the activity that you would see would periodically rise and fall just like this, giving you something very much in the flavor of the data we were looking at, this, a length tuning curve with multiple peaks. And just to make this a little more clear, I put together a little movie. So on the top, you will see a stimulus growing in length. In the middle, you'll see cortical position here. And this is going to be the inhibitory conductance received uh, at the cell at each one of these positions. And on the bottom, you'll see the activity just at the middle of the network. And you see, because the edge of the stimulus representation is always a peak in the wave, the activity in the middle rises and falls and rises and falls. And it's kind of pleasing to watch. Um, let that go. And there we are. Um, and so that's this slide again. Wait, so this is, this is a, 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 an edge effect? Is it, is it for each of these ohms to be to have instability during stability, or all of that has to do with the edge? Um, so it is largely here due to the edge effect. If you, if you had a stimulus that was infinitely long, but it's the edge of the stimulus, not of the network. So the network itself is infinitely long. Right. right. But yeah, so this relies on the edges of the stimulus representation having these peaks. Well, no, but also, it's, it's, it's actually amplifying. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, the interesting thing that we then find is not only can the inhibition stabilized network regime give you this effect, um, but in fact it's required, uh, in particular for the inhibition. So, to see that, it's actually quite easy. Um, you can do it in a couple of steps. And this is math that I showed here last year, so I'll run through this quickly. Um, the idea is if you've got a weight matrix of this design, where this is your EE and your IE, et cetera, um, because all of the connections are translationally invariant, uh, they're diagonalized by the Fourier transform, uh, the question that was asked. So um, if you go to the domain of spatial frequency, uh, what you get are four uh, diagonal submatrices. And what that allows us to do is to rewrite the activity in terms of independent EI pairs of spatial frequency. So this is the excitatory inhibitory activity at each spatial frequency. Um, then each one of these EI equations evol <coughs> pardon me, evolves independently. Yeah? Uh, so here we have the same number of each, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, we can then just solve for the fixed points here. Oh, and an important point to, to point out. So Ken talked about um, how when you've got translationally invariant connections, your, your feed forward weights uh, are always of, of length one. And so if you, if you rewrite that, you can rewrite this equation here. Um, and you, what you get are just individual EI pairs on the diagonal at each spatial frequency. And so each one exactly has a length of each forward for each feed forward connection that is your off diagonal term has a weight of exactly one and pointing to nothing there. I apologize. Um, but it, it holds in this case as well. Um, so you solve for the fixed point, and then you just ask the very simple question where is the maximum you know, power in this, in this spatial frequency? Uh, what spatial frequency do you get the maximum power in the inhibitory firing rates? And you can solve for that, and it is exactly here in terms of uh, the network parameters. So here, JEE -E is the amplitude of the Gaussian for the E to E connections. Sigma E is the spatial extent, the, the sigma of that Gaussian. Um, 
and then sigma i, which is right over there, is the spatial extent of the connections from E cells to I cells. So that's the other Gaussian uh, connectivity function. And so you'll get a peak at exactly this spatial frequency, um, which will be real and greater than zero when the following two conditions are met. So first, that sigma i is greater than sigma e. So the connections from E cells to other I cells should on average be a little bit wider than E to E. And then once you have that, you have that this JEE sigma e root two pi be greater than this ratio. And this is interesting here because if this first requirement holds, then this ratio is always greater than one. And this term here, JEE sigma e root two pi, is precisely the largest eigenvalue of the E to E connection matrix. And so this gives you the reason why the E to E connections must be unstable. You must be in this ISN regime in order to get this uh, boosting of a non-zero spatial frequency. Professor, yeah. So I don't have any. Because basically, it's not so much that it's not it's not just stabilizing the overall binary region. It's basically trying to stabilize a much more complicated problem than I think any of us uh, can raise. But uh, the reason that it makes sense is all the way up to that point. So I don't have a, a theoretical answer. One thing I can tell you, I don't have the slides here, is if you play around with this in a, in, a, in a large model with probabilistic connections. Um, I mean, there's no pure translational invariance there. You, you lose that once you have you know, a large network with thousands and thousands of neurons. Um, but but the, the effects still persist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Cool. Sorry. OK. Okay, so um, what else do I have to say about this? Oh, so one last experimental result before I move on to the nonlinear work. Uh, so as we were working on this, this paper came out by Tanaka and Osawa, and they were exploring a different aspect of center and surround structure. They were curious, uh, a lot of uh, work from this group has looked at asymmetries in the center and surround structure. And so they wanted to probe the spatial structure of center and surround receptive fields and they did so using an interesting type of stimulus. Um, well, you kind of get the effect here. Uh, so what they did was they overlaid a traditional luminance grating. That's the thing moving from uh, left to right here uh, that was tuned for the preferred spatial frequency and orientation of the center receptive field of the cell they were recording from. And they overlaid that stimulus with a lower spatial frequency contrast modulation envelope. And that's what you can see moving from the top to bottom. And what they found, interestingly, was that um, cells in V1 were well tuned over here to the orientation and spatial frequency of these slow or these low spatial frequency contrast modulations. Uh, and so they have the tuning curves here, and they see that they're well orientation tuned, uh, and they don't care about direction, so that's positive and negative spatial frequency here. Um, but they do care about orientation, and also interesting, the orientation tuning for these low spatial frequency contrast modulations uh, was independent of the orientation tuning for the luminance grading in the center receptive field. Uh, and so this is a histogram of all the cells that are recorded from. And the point that I just want to make is that this is a much lower spatial frequency between 0.05 and 0.2 cycles per degree here than one would typically record for uh, a luminance grading in the center receptive field. Um, and this is interesting because here they're looking at contrast modulation envelopes. And that's equivalent in terms of our model. Instead of just using a smoothed um, step function input as the contrast profile, instead using a stimulus which itself has some sinusoidal modulation of contrast. And so if we show our network stimuli uh, designed to match that experiment, we see the same sharp tuning for contrast modulation spatial frequency. And that's shown here. Um, and the spatial frequency for contrast modulation that our network prefers are precisely the, uh, if you will, resonant spatial frequencies of excitation inhibition. That is the peaks 
in the fixed point firing rates for the excitatory and inhibitory cells. Um, and so that's, we thought that was cool. It sort of provided some after the fact experimental validation that maybe this model is onto something. Um, and so with that, I want to then move on to the nonlinear stuff. I'm doing pretty good. Um, so why, why a nonlinear model? Why do we care about nonlinearity? Uh, the reason we care about nonlinearity is we know that the extra classical receptor field changes qualitatively with stimulus contrast. And this is uh, stuff that's already been discussed a little bit today. Um, uh, how does it change? So one important way that it changes is that these spatial periodicity, these, these dual peaked length tuning curves that we explore, seem to only be found when probing with high contrast stimuli. So that's true of the Anderson et al. data that we showed earlier, uh, as well as firing rate curves here from St. Pierre et al. Uh, you only see these second peaks really with high contrast stimuli. But there's other major changes, and this is stuff that's already been addressed. Another major thing that people have looked at is the idea that um, surround stimuli that are suppressive at high contrast can actually be facilitating at low contrast. And so you can see that here. Uh, if you've just got a center stimulus alone, this, this, this uh, filled circle here, as you move from low to high contrast, you get a nice sigmoid contrast response function. You add a high contrast stimuli, a high contrast surround stimuli, and you suppress when the center is at high contrast, but you facilitate when the center is at low contrast. And this is another figure from another author, a paper that came out around the same time, showing basically the same effect. It's well known that the summation field uh, for cells in V1 shrinks considerably as you move from low to high contrast. And so the summation field here is defined really as the location of the first peak in your length tuning curve. Uh, and when Sanyak et al. looked at many, many cells across many layers and many cell types, uh, they found a pretty wide distribution, but an average of around a 2.3-fold uh, shrinking of summation field as it move from low to high contrast. And so that's all this data here. So where do these come from? Well, we know, for one thing, that they require nonlinearity. All the work I showed you up to now is with a linear network, but we know that a linear model can only scale its response with contrast. Uh, we're, we're here, we're representing contrast really as the strength of the input to the network. Uh, but if we want to get these qualitative changes, we have to introduce some kind of nonlinearity. Now, previous work proposed that these contrast-dependent changes could arise through asymmetric contrast response functions between excitatory and inhibitory cells. And a picture of what that might look like is here. And you can't see the difference here, so I'll just draw it. But the, the, the authors here proposed that inhibitory cells have a higher input threshold, but also a higher gain than excitatory cells. And you can imagine how this could give you, for example, that change from facilitation to suppression. If you imagine you're probing with low contrast stimuli, um, then only the excitatory cells are, ha are, are active because the inhibitory cells uh, are being excited below their threshold. Then you increase the input to those cells by adding a surround stimulus, and only the excitatory cells uh, increase their firing rate because the inhibitory cells are below their uh, threshold, and so you'd get facilitation. But then when you move to the high contrast regime, both E and I cells are firing. So now if you um, add a surround stimulus, both E and I cells will increase their firing rate, but the I cells more so because they have greater gain. And so this would give you uh, that change from facilitation to suppression. The problem is it's not entirely clear that this mechanism exists in V1. And so in 2003, Contreras and Palmer published uh, the results from their intracellular studies of excitatory or regular spiking and uh, uh, inhibitory or fast spiking cells. And what they found is when they fit the contrast response functions of the E and I cells with, a, with this equation here, that it was, it was statistically, you could not distinguish between E and I cells statistically on the basis of either the exponent n or the C50, the contrast at half maximum firing rate. And E and I cells only differed uh, on the basis of their R max. But these, these two parameters here, this n and the C50, are really describing the, the gain in the threshold. And if you couldn't distinguish between them, it's not really clear that you could have a mechanism like this. I say here the data is inconclusive. This is something that people continue to debate to this day. Just this last year at SFN, there was probably three posters arguing either sides of this point. So I say the data is inconclusive, and we might want to look for other mechanisms. And so what we hypothesize as an alternative mechanism for getting these contrast-dependent changes is a network 
that could transition between dynamic regimes. And the way it would work is like this. You imagine you've now got a nonlinear network where the input to the cells first has to go through some nonlinearity. For example, here a power law with a gain and an exponent uh, k and n. Because this nonlinearity is accelerating, at low contrast, the gain of individual cells is very, very shallow. So as you increase the input to any one cell, its firing rate doesn't change much, its output doesn't change much, and so effective recurrent connectivity is very weak. But then as you move to the high contrast regime, where the gain becomes much steeper, now the effective recurrent connectivity is actually quite strong. And so if there are strong synapses in place, you could imagine how you could transition into uh, this, this ISN regime, which requires unstable recurrent excitation. Uh, and so we implement this model using these equations here. Uh, we've got, uh, so here are the equations. Again, these are, uh, now finally I show the uh, equations for the connectivity. I apologize about that. Um, and here are the parameters. And I just want to highlight here that the n and the k parameters are the same between E and I, because we just want to see if we can do this, if we can get these effects uh, using the same parameters. So there is no effect to a local? This is extended network? This is the same extended network now, but, but with uh, nonlinear rate equations. So we build a nonlinear model, and of course, if you want to work with a nonlinear model, what's the first thing you do to analyze it? You linearize it. So we can. Um, look at the Jacobian matrix of the system, and in fact, we see that with increasing contrast, and here, contrast is still arbitrary, it's just the linear strength of the input. Uh, so I just, just highlight that here. You see that at a certain contrast, the E to E connection matrix goes unstable, but the uh, overall weight matrix W stays stable. Uh, just highlighting that the network undergoes uh, this kind of transition, we can now see if the response properties of the network match that. And so the first thing we can look for here is that paradoxical response that uh, was first described by Misha Sodix. And so what we do is we stimulate all of the cells in the network with some baseline contrast stimulus. Uh, so here it's very low, and then we increase the contrast. And then we probe with just a little extra input to the inhibitory cells, and we see what is their response. And so no matter what we do to the inhibitory cells, the excitatory cells, as we expect, always have a decrease in their firing rate. But the inhibitory cells undergo a, a switch. So at low contrast, where the re effective recurrent connectivity is too weak to give you the ISN property, you get an increase in the inhibitory cell firing rate. But then once you increase the contrast of the, of the, of the baseline stimulus uh, to the point where the network transitions into this new dynamic regime, you now get a decrease in the inhibitory cell firing rate, showing that uh, the response properties of this network uh, match our prediction. So then the next thing to do, oh, and so, I'm sorry. This is just uh, here, the endpoints of these four curves. And you can do this for all sorts of baseline contrasts just to get a nice view of, of where that transition occurs. Uh, so now the next thing to do is to see if uh, this nonlinear network can explain some of these contrast-dependent changes and response properties. So the first thing we do is repeat our length tuning tests now with stimuli of increase in contrast. And sure enough, we see as we increase the contrast of the stimulus, both the excitatory and inhibitory length tuning curves begin to show uh, these second peaks, the emergence of this spatially periodic activity. And again, just to remind you of what we're trying to emulate here, just the emergence of the second peak at high contrast. Uh, so that was cool, and we were happy about that result. You will also notice, as we increase the contrast, and the firing rate length tuning, well, actually, these are uh, conductance length tuning curves, become more and more uh, spatially periodic, you get that the, the location of this first peak, that is the summation field, moves further and further to the left. So what we're seeing here is a, a shrinking of summation fields. So that's here. And so if we call the, the high contrast summation field 1, just to compare the data that's going to appear over here, you see that at low contrast, the, the summation fields get progressively larger and larger and larger um, and increase in a range that is well matched uh, by experimental data. So here, Senyak et al. report a range of anywhere between you know, one and 10 fold growth, all of which uh, match well the, uh, the changes that fall along this curve. And this change in summation field size that's so pronounced gives us um, the last effect that we're trying to model here, which is the change from suppression for high contrast center stimuli to facilitation for low contrast center stimuli. Uh, and so again, this is the same data I already showed you. And so you see here, 
your surround stimuli uh, falls outside of the, uh, the extent of the summation field for high contrast. But as we lower the contrast of the center stimuli, here we get um, that the originally suppressive stimuli is actually falling within the summation field. Uh, and so it gives you net facilitation, uh, giving you that switch between facilitation and suppression. And so this is just a summary of those three features. Um, and so you see that as you transition with increase in contrast from the non-ISN to the ISN regime, you get the emergence of spatial periodicity. This causes the shrinking in summation field, which gives you the net change from facilitation to suppression for surround stimuli. So I've got about a uh, little time left. So I will now finish up looking at this question of normalization. Uh, and so just to sort of help that, you'll notice here that the contrast response function to the center stimulus alone is saturating. But I told you that we modeled these cells as having a power law nonlinearity. So there's nothing about the individual cellular biophysics that we annoyed here um, that would necessarily predict this uh, saturation. And so we saw this. We said, you know, this is, this is, this is kind of like gain normalization. This, this, this network is kind of normalizing uh, the input as we increase the contrast. So maybe um, we can say something about uh, normalization with this model. And so to do that, I sort of have to introduce a different uh, couple of experiments. So. so two papers came out in the past year that both show the same experimental results. I'll sum them up both first once, and then I can point to individual aspects. But the idea is that when you record from a population of cells in V1, the population response to two simultaneously presented stimuli appears to be closer to the mean or average than the sum of the two stimuli alone. Uh, and so you can see that here. They show a population of cells characterized by the preferred orientation, uh, either a 45 or 135 degree grading. You get a nice big response. In blue, they average the response to these two gratings. And in red, they show the response to the two stimuli presented at the same time. And uh, in this, in this experiment, uh, they find that the response is very, very closely matched to the average of uh, the two stimuli alone. Uh, and so this is with intrinsic signal imaging. Uh, here uh, in, in Busey et al., this is out of uh, Carandini's lab, they measure firing rate, and they see the same basic effect. They don't see an exact averaging. What they report here is what they call a sublinear addition. So the response to two stimuli appears to be somewhere between 0.6 times 0.7 uh, of the sum of the individual stimuli alone. So they, they get a sublinear addition of the two stimuli here, and they, they show that here. Uh, so you get sublinear uh, weighting of the two stimuli here. Uh, important in this paper, they also show that as you vary the contrast between the two stimuli, you get uh, what they characterize as a winner-take-all effect. And so as the contrast between the two stimuli become, become different, now all of a sudden your response to the greater contrast stimulus, you can basically it, 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 it wins. It takes all. So you can ignore the response to the low contrast stimulus. Uh, so here's optical imaging here. Here is uh, extracellular recording. Um, OK. So we wanted to know if our, our network could do something like this. Of course, we have to modify it greatly to, to look at these kind of experiments. So basically what we do is we now take our network and we wrap it together on the ends. And so instead of characterizing cells by their preferred position or retinotopic space, we now characterize them by the preferred orientation. Uh, we basically we, we, we recreate a version of the, of the ring model. Um, and so we do that here. Uh, so we model uh, a ring of preferred orientation. We also change the connectivity a lot here. So uh, obviously, on, on a ring, uh, connectivity is very different than it is across retinotopic space. So here we model, um, you can either use either cosine or Gaussian connectivity. Um, and what's important about this, when we model the connections as a function of orientation distance, or model connections in, in orientation space, we use the same connectivity functions for all four connection matrices. So E to E, E to I, and also the I to E and I to I. They all have the same spatial extent, and they only differ in the relative amplitudes. Um, and then using the same equations before, we, we show this network uh, one stimulus here of 45 degrees, one of 135 degrees, and then the two together. And you can see that there's a blue line, it was blue, uh, blue line here showing the best fit of the sum of these two and the sublinear weights we get here around 0.65, so a big sublinear addition. 
Uh, and so on the bottom plot here, I show you the actual sum of the two responses in green, their mean in blue, and in red, the results that we see. Uh, now you might say, well, maybe this just happens because inhibition you know, is, is greatly enhanced by the two stimuli. And so maybe that's all that's going on. But of course, that doesn't really fit with uh, all the other stuff that we've talked about today. So not surprisingly, inhibition also shows the same kind of sublinear uh, addition uh, for two stimuli rather than one. Um, let's go on. Additionally, this network uh, has this same winner-take-all effect. So as we vary the contrast of the two oriented stimuli, eventually you can just ignore the second stimulus and the two weights that get assigned to the two gratings further and further apart until one basically approaches zero. Now, if you take a step further and work with a nonlinear input, that is, if you assume that the input coming from the LGN has its own contrast response function so that it saturates, uh, then you can uh, actually get a really nice approximation of data as shown in Pusey et al. Um, I mean, there's really not much to say here other than winner-take-all effect. Um, oh, and then one last really cool effect. So earlier work, um, uh, and this is a paper published Karen Dini et al. 99, um, they showed that you don't always get sublinear addition. You can also get what we call superlinear addition. And so here they show, uh, so this is a low contrast oriented stimulus by itself uh, here at 1%, and then they overlay it with uh, a mask, that's a, an orthogonal stimulus of, of varying contrast, and they see that when uh, they're at low contrast, a, a, mask, a masking stimulus can actually be facilitating rather than suppressing. And so if we change the contrast of our two stimuli and look at the, the weights that come out, these, these, these additive weights, we find that although it's sublinear for most of contrast space, again, this is on an arbitrary scale, um, at low contrast, we also see superlinear addition, so a facilitation uh, by adding a second grading stimulus to the first. Um, and so that's, that's what we show here. And so mechanism. So this is really where the work is today, what we're still working on, and trying to understand exactly what are the details, what are the requirements for this. And I can't say for certainty what they are, but we have some pretty interesting hints one is that it appears that this, this shrinking summation field, this, this change in length tuning, is occurring in this network as well, but now as a function of the input width when we're dealing in orientation space. And what does this mean, right? What is, what is the input width in orientation space? It doesn't seem to make too much intuitive sense because a grading stimulus has just one orientation. And so what we're really talking about on this x-axis here uh, just to point out in case you can't read. So as you increase stimulus contrast, the, the tuning width becomes shorter and shorter and shorter, the same as it was occurring for the length tuning experiments. Um, but now the input width here, the only thing that you can think that is sort of a physiological correlate for this is the tuning of the feed forward input. You can imagine that the, the feed forward tuning coming to these cells, so how wide an oriented stimulus uh, sort of hits in, uh, on this ring, so how many, how many cells does it input to? Um, you could assume that that's fixed as a function of orientation, because we know that orientation tuning is contrast invariant. And so what's changing here is what this network would prefer to see. But of course, you can only ever see one thing. And so as we move from low contrast, where the network would prefer to see something very broadly tuned in orientation, maybe something closer to what it actually sees when it sees two orthogonal gratings, but then as we move to higher contrast, now this network would like to see something very narrowly tuned, something more closely uh, approximated by the input from just one oriented grading. And so that's why you can see this superlinear addition at low contrast, but then sublinear addition at high contrast, where a where broadly tuned input uh, would be very bad for this network. Um, and let's see, so the only other thing I have to say, so the, how does the ISN regime relate to this, we're not entirely sure just yet. It is interesting to note that the network transitions into the ISN regime, so that is the I cells here go uh, below zero, at a contrast that occurs before you have that relative, uh, before you switch to, su to sublinear addition. So this is a complicated plot, so I'll just very quickly. In green is how the 
inhibitory cells respond to a small extra input as a function of contrast. Where they cross this dashed line is where you transition into the ISN regime. And then these blue curves are the same curves I showed you, the additive weights assigned uh, for two stimuli rather than one. And you see that you enter the ISN regime before you can get sublinear addition. And I think that that is all I've got. So thanks for listening. This is a very blurry picture of the Columbia Center. So thanks for listening. Please. Right, so that's a good question. So one thing, I don't have the slide here, but that was one of the first concerns that I had. And so if you measure the uh, orientation tuning of an individual cell as a function of increase in contrast, there, the, the orientation tuning width doesn't change at all. Um, so, so how, how does it, uh, how is it consistent with, with shrinking of, uh, uh, of, the, of the length summation? Uh, right, so, right, so, you have to more or less assume that the input is going to be of a fixed width. So let's say it's 15, 15 so degrees. You mean, input, you, mean, you mean LGN input or you mean network input? Uh, sorry, I mean LGN input. Well, LGN is, yeah, whatever it is. Uh, it, visual. Right. So whatever it is, it is. And then, so here you've got a certain response. So we're, we're showing a 5% contrast stimulus, and you get a certain response. Now at 20 at a, at a contrast of 20%, you see that you've had a much greater response. And so if you were to plot a contrast response curve here, you would just see sort of a nice sigmoid curve. Um, but what this is saying is that if there was some way to broaden the LGN input, uh, let's say here at 10%, that you might actually get a big increase in your response. Whereas at high contrast, if you were to broaden the LGN input, you'd actually see a decrease. Right, so maybe I should. Uh, should, should I be happy now? <laughs> no, so so. Right, so. No, this is the beginner. No, that's good. I just put it up. Yeah. Oh, 